which well, is lovely. Whoever's so Samantha, clicking for you needs the clicker. Right over there. <laughs> Great. Thank you. And Dana, yay. I have known Thanks, Dana, Kate. and it's so wonderful <laughs> to see great things happen to really great people. And clearly, Dana is one, right? So two things. Clearly, we need to take Wyoming back, ladies. And I'm going to announce it here, and I know Marlene is down with this. We are going to be chartering a plane, and we will see you next year in Jamaica. <laughs> so um, I wanted to take uh, a chance to introduce myself. I'm Kate Byrne. I am Watermark's Vice President of Membership, Partnership, and Sponsorship. I wanted to give a shout out to all of you who have yet to join our merry little band. But then I also wanted to thank all the uh, current members that we have and say thank you for your support. We're turning 25, and in honor of that, we have created a special promotion for today's attendees, if you have not become a member yet, to take advantage of a 25th anniversary special we're doing, whereby you will receive 25% off of basic membership level. What does that translate into? If you're a senior level executive, you pay $333 for the year, and then 40% discount. For you emerging execs, it's $181 or $15 a month, or your Netflix membership, or three lattes. And it gives you access to extraordinary content like today. We've got so much more ahead of us. It gives you access to potential leadership development workshops when your company is one of our partners. And more importantly, you get to spend more time with this great community that you're surrounded by. So if you're interested in that, I'll be here all day. Feel free to come up and talk to me. Ping me at kate at wearewatermark.org, or if you're so inspired, go to the website, wearewatermark.org, under membership, hit happy 25 when you go through the prompts, and then we look forward to seeing you at future events. Secondly, because one of the things that we do, and this is what Mary and Marlene and myself do all throughout the year, is we're constantly looking for ways looking out on the horizon of how we can provide better service and be more of a benefit to you so that you can be the best you, be it your career, your company, or in your community. To this end, we have just worked with, Samantha, click, thank you. Um, we've just are in the process of announcing a partnership with a terrific women-run organization called The Guild. And The Guild is a connection platform. And what it does is through a profile that you build and you make your requests of what kind of connection you'd like to have, then utilizing an algorithm, we're going to do pre-vetted connections and meet, so make some suggestions to people that we think would be helpful for you. And then, Calgon, take me away. We're going to actually be making recommendations of where you two can meet, and then you two can take it from there. We'll be sending out information uh, within the next couple of weeks as that rolls out, so please keep an eye out on your emails. Because really, one of the things we've recognized, if nothing else, that whole adage, right, about how change is the, the only constant. So that's what our next group is going to be sharing and talking about best practices and how to navigate that. Uh, our panel all around uh, talking about embracing and thriving through change is going to be addressing that reality that so many of us are experiencing. And it's either through a corporate layoff, it could be a merger and an acquisition, or it could even be through exponential growth. But wouldn't it be great to take that change, harness it, and address it from a position of power and opportunity as opposed to from victimization? And that's what these amazing women are going to do. We are very fortunate in having the illustrious and terrific Cami Dunaway, who is going to be the captain at the helm of this conversation, to keep the nautical theme going. And uh, she has no stranger to change herself. She's worked at some of the uh, world's largest companies, Yahoo, and I know there are a few Yahoo people out here. Woo! Ladies will be chatting later. <laughs> Um, Nintendo and Frito-Lay to name a few and as she was rising up through the ranks she came to realize that you know what promotion yeah that's part of my happiness but my real and success but really the true element of success is happiness she's written a fantastic book called Fit, um, Fit Matters and uh, where she shares her best practices her experiences and then also talks about how important it is to invest the time in yourself to find a job that really matters so with that I'd love to Welcome, Cami Dunaway, on up Great. to the stage. All right, yeah, you guys come on in. <laughs> Hi, 
Hi, everybody. Thank you, Kate, for that lovely introduction. And as uh, Kate said, we are going to spend the next hour talking about change. Because we are in just unprecedented times, aren't we? And I completely agree with the adage that the only thing that we can count on is that things are going to be different next month, next year. Our businesses are changing at an unprecedented rate because consumer needs are changing. Technology is changing. And so what we want to do is talk about how do we not just survive in that environment, but how do we actually embrace it? And how can we actually thrive in this era of change? And so let's just take a quick poll. How many of you guys have had to undergo some sort of relatively significant change, either in your personal life or in your professional life, in let's just say the past two years? OK, yeah, all of us, right? And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but you know, just think about, has it created a little bit of stress in your life? You know, for, for most people, the answer would be yes. I, we'll go to the next slide. I want to show you some research that I came across. This is from the American Psychological Association, who does this annual study on stress in America. And this is their 2017 study. And they ask folks what their stress level is on a scale of 1 to 10. And between 2016 and 2017, it's increased from 4.8 to 5.1. And 20% of the Americans that they surveyed said that they are experiencing extreme stress, either an 8, a 9, or a 10 on the scale. And what are the sources of our stress? It's money, it's our jobs, and it's the economy, primarily, followed by health issues. I thought this was pretty interesting, and we may talk a bit about this on the panel. Women experience more stress than men. And interestingly, stress levels were higher in younger Americans. Millennials gave it a 5.6, whereas um, matures were only a 2.7. So we are very fortunate today to have a panel of three women who are really good at navigating change, not only in their own lives, and we'll talk about their personal experiences, but we'll also talk about how they've thought about navigating change um, among their teams, helping their organizations, you know, helping other people navigate change. So let me introduce them to you. Um, so first, right here to my left is Denise Thomas. And Denise is the manager of contracts and pricing at at Gilead, and she has over 10 years of experience in pricing, and this is an area of rapid change, particularly in the pharmaceutical industry, in which she has a lot of her history and expertise. Um, she also serves as Gilead's co-lead in their leadership organization for Black Employees Strategic Partnership. And so in that role and in other roles, she really does a lot to help individuals think about thriving in a time of constant change. Um, she earned her degree in economics and finance from Southern Illinois University and has made a lot of moves, which we'll talk about. And I ask all of these women to tell me on a scale of one to five, with five being, I really love change. I am constantly looking for what's new. I get bored quickly. And one being, you know, no, I, I like things pretty stable. Tell me where you are. So when I asked that question to Denise, she said, hey, if you're not scared, you're not growing. So put me on that four and a half to, uh, to five. Um, next to Denise is um, Bindu Garapati. And Bindu is the Marketing Talent and Leadership Development Manager at Juniper. Yay. And in that role, she is really driving new grad and senior leadership development and helping people to really think about thriving with change. But as all of these panelists are and all of you are, she's very multifaceted. She is also an entrepreneur. She's CEO of a company called The Happy Leader. And she is an academic, so she has her doctorate in uh, in clinical psychology, so she can give us some really helpful perspective um, from that mode. And she also was honored last year as an Emerging Executive of the Year with Watermark. And when I asked her the question about rating herself one to five, she said, oh, I'm an eight. 
<laughs> but interestingly, she didn't just like you know, uh, spring out of the womb that way. She said she's really had to learn to navigate change, particularly in her role as a partner and as a mother. So we may get into a little bit of that conversation as well. And then over on our far side, we have Liz Lawler. And Liz is the Human Resources Project Program Manager for Intuit. So we are so grateful to them for giving us this beautiful location. And she's got a really interesting role in that she is really helping Intuit through this um, incredible period of transformation and helping to assess new talent, helping to develop new talent to be able to flourish in a time of change. Um, she also went through change herself as part of Intuit's HR rotational program. And she has her business administration degree from Cal Poly. And she said that she would put herself at about a four and a half, that she had some early roles in her career that felt a little too um, kind of routine. And so she's learned that she really does like a little bit of change in her life. So that is our esteemed panel. And let's start with reflecting back on that research. You know, it showed that we are pretty stressed, particularly as women. And so I'd love to hear what you think um, are some of the, the changes that people are facing at work that really contribute to this level of stress. So let's, let's start with you, Denise. I first want to say looking across this room is absolutely incredible. I have been in the Bay Area now for um, almost two years, and this is the most inspired I have ever been. <laughs> so this is an absolutely diverse group yeah. of women, diverse backgrounds. This is incredible. So kudos to Watermark for, for putting together <laughs> these events. <laughs> All right. I, I have to say that. Um, so just looking at the statistics where you have 61% of our of, of uh, stress contributed by work and the other 50, the economy, um, these things are closely tied to our jobs and our careers. Conventional wisdom teaches us that, hey, if you work hard, you work smart, you'll be rewarded for your efforts. But what happens when that doesn't happen? Mm -hmm. Because guess what, oftentimes that happens. So what I've just uh, done is I, I, I made a commitment to myself that regardless of what, what change is going on around me, I will persevere. I will, will work through it and try to make that transition a little easy as, as possible. And then also when we think that we're, 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 in fear, we're fearful of losing our, our, our jobs and and thinking that we are extend, uh, expendable, um, we sometimes make rash decisions. So just take a step back and say to yourself, well, what can I do to make this a more smoother transition? Because it's, it's going to happen, yeah. whether Great. we're aboard or not. But do what do you think? I think the other layers to that is very contextual. You think about the political climate that we're in, and we were just talking about this earlier in terms of social media and how that can impact definitely money, stress, changes that are going on in our environment. But there's, it's a multi-layer ecosystem, right? There's change within us, just again, as women, bodies evolving, changing, growing, transitioning, just very personally from a biochemical perspective. I'm not revealing anything now. I'm just pointing <laughs> out. <laughs> Um, but how much of us really take time to consider and think about that in the context of all these other layers that are going on? There's our work environment, our political system, just our climate, all of those layers. And I think that sometimes taking a step back to be able to say which one and which aspect of this is influencing me the most right now and being able to um, hone in on that. Great. Yeah, and I would just add that um, I think uncertainty is stressful, and that's really, you know, the, the stress comes from the unknown. If you don't know if your job is secure, if the marketplace is changing, if um, your company will be successful. And so I like the idea of, you know, removing yourself and looking at the bigger, broader picture and finding the excitement in that unknown. Because as the, although it's very scary, when something is new and unknown to you, you have a real opportunity to grow, and it can be exciting. So trying to find the, the positive and, and the uncertainty. 
I love that idea of finding the excitement and the unknown. And Denise, you've got a great motto for the year. Will you share a little bit about that and kind of where that came from? So my motto of the year, which I think is a lifetime now, is uh, <laughs> the year of the why not. So I, I, I try to view every scenario and situation that I counter as a learning opportunity. I take the approach, guess what? The world is going to go on with or without me. So I might as well move with it. Mm -hmm. And um, I have made a commitment to myself to get comfortable with being uncomfortable, right? Get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Because guess what? You're always prepared to be uncomfortable. <laughs> um, and so that's led me to the motto of the year of the why not. Why not try something new? Why not volunteer, because we're always voluntold, for this project. Why, so, so why not put myself out there? Why not um, step outside of my boundaries, push those boundaries? Um, and following that uh, approach, so many opportunities have opened up for me. So why not? The only guaranteed failure is to not try, right? So at least if I try, I've, I've, I have a 50-50 chance. But if I don't try, I'm guaranteed to fail, and I haven't learned anything. So that's, um, that's the year. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about one of those uh, um, changes that you embraced through this year of Why Not. Just moving from Boston to the Bay Area, picking up, moving here. You know, I don't have family here. Uh, just, just doing that. And then also, like, I, I, I have been volunteering more. I have been raising my hand and say, hey, I want to lead this. Give me the opportunity. Yes, it's going to be more work. I realize this. However, I am growing at, at the end. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, Benu, tell us a little bit about a time that you've navigated through a significant change in your life. So, there's been so many, but um, I'll <laughs> highlight on two very similarly. So, six years ago, my family and I moved here to Chicago, uh, from Chicago to the Bay Area. And I had been in Chicago for the past 18 years, quite established professionally, personally, all those things, and to come out to the, to the valley. And it was one of those things career-wise, you know, I was at that fork in the road where my executive coaching practice was going great. I got to get introduced to a lot of companies in the valley in that way, learn more about the cultural context and what was important to Silicon Valley culture. And um, I really enjoy a lot of the diversity and inclusion work. So doing diversity and inclusion in the Midwest is very different than doing diversity <laughs> and inclusion. I was unique out there. <laughs> uh, so I move out here, and it's kind of like, okay, there are many people, a sea of South Asians that look similar to me, um, have very similar immigrant, uh, my parents were immigrants, immigrant stories and how they were raised and that whole coconut crisis, as Mindy Kaling refers to, you know, kind of brown on the outside, white on the inside. <laughs> and so um, it's like, wait, there's so many more coconuts out here. <laughs> and we can talk and connect about these things in a whole different level that brings this piece of authenticity, which I, I, I kind of struggled with, because wait a second, in the Midwest, I was known for being South Asian and being able to be an ambassador for the culture and talk about things, and why do you wear those dots, and does your skin color come off, you know, those kinds of things growing up. Yeah, yeah. Here's some interesting things, <laughs> great for stories. Um, but then out here, it's almost a different navigation in terms of, wait a second, my identity didn't so much change, but... My perspective of that did in some capacity because it's not those conversations anymore. Now it's, oh, you're first gen and which part of India or which part did your parents come from and those kinds of stories to be able to navigate that. So that, that was an interesting personal, professional, cultural change and shift that just happened by relocating. Yeah. Talk a little bit about how that helped you grow professionally going through that personal change. Definitely. Well, I think, you know, I'm a true believer that the universe brings you what you need when you need it, mm -hmm. right? And that change definitely came. So I have an academic and, um, and a clinical background, right? I've worked in healthcare. I've worked in academia. So when I was at that fork in the road, it was one of those where it's like, why not try technology? 
um, especially the world of acronyms, right? So for me, when I hear API, I think, you know, Academic Performance Index, Asian Pacific Islander, but in Silicon Valley, it's Application Programming Interface, right? So, so that whole transition and thinking, you know, if something is so core to my identity of being South Asian, being American, um, how does that translate to completely gym, jumping into a new skill set? So I work in a technology company in marketing. I don't have that background. <laughs> but I've learned to evolve, and it's given me that confidence. Well, if you can navigate outside in terms of um, your identity, a role that you have gives a lot more fluidity. So it's kind of taking small risks and practicing those and mm -hmm. saying, OK, I fell a little. But you know what? There was an incredible group of supporters, mm -hmm. of women, mentors, colleagues that are there for us. And it's OK. How do you embrace that? Yeah. And I loved how Deanna talked about that grace versus grit. And the grit, I always think of grit as resiliency. But now I'm thinking in a, in a totally different perspective. Yep. So for any of you guys who follow our wonderful host here into it, you know that it's a company that's really embracing change. And so Liz, I'd be curious, when you decided to join into it, was that, was that part of the appeal? How did you think about uh, your fit with the culture here? Yeah, definitely. So my first corporate job um, was at another tech company, and I had a really great experience. But the role I was in was very routine. It was I followed the same process every day, and every day looked the same. So when I knew I wanted something new and different, I looked at Intuit and um, saw how much change was happening there. And my goal was to find a company in a role where no two days were ever the same. So I'd be continually surprised every day, and in that way I can grow my career. And I looked at Intuit, and we're going from a product company selling our CD-ROMs and staples <laughs> to a platform, online platform company, and there's been such an evolution in the kind of talent we need. So for me, sitting in HR, we have, in the three years I've been here, we've had to change the way we hire talent, change the way we assess, and really change and evaluate how we work across the company. And so this gave me an opportunity opportunity to jump in in the midst of all this change and, and help drive some of it and, and innovate. And I found a role where I could be creative and not feel stifled by routine. So it, mm -hmm. was, it was a great fit. And did you immediately thrive? Has it just been easy for you, or were there some learnings along the way? Definitely not. <laughs> so, um, Cami mentioned I came in through a rotational program, and one of my early rotations, I went onto a team that was moving faster than I had ever moved before. I was just not prepared to keep up with the pace of the business. And I went in guns blazing, really wanting to prove myself. And in doing so, I didn't really take the time to establish relationships and get to know my manager. And my manager wasn't giving me the feedback I needed to, um, to really grow. Mm -hmm. And she didn't know that because I didn't tell her. And I didn't want to ask for help because I didn't want to come off incompetent or inexperienced, mm -hmm. even though I was inexperienced. <laughs> <laughs> so it really, I struggled. And I was not performing well. And I let myself flounder probably mm -hmm. much too long before finally I put my ego aside and was like, I need to ask for help. Mm. And once I did, everything kind of clicked into place. And I really learned that in this constant, ever-changing environment um, of the work we do at Intuit and all of your work, it's really important to take the time to lay that foundation of trust and relationships. But also be able to ask for help. And now anyone who works with me, I hope, I think there's a few of you in here, know that I ask a lot of questions, but hopefully that translates to me being engaged and thoughtful and uh, less inexperienced or incompetent like I was worried initially. Great lesson there, part of thriving and change. Ask for what you need. How about you guys? Did you just kind of spring forth as an eight and a four and a half in <laughs> responding to change, or did you have some growing along uh, the journey. Absolutely not sprung out of the womb in that way, I <laughs> wish, if there was a secret formula for that. Um, no, I, it's funny, when we were prepping for the panel, I was telling Cami, I used to be a very appropriately anal uh, individual and had to be, you know, if I had a meeting at 7, I was there at 6.59, I wrote down the plan, the process, this is exactly how things would go. Well, guess how many times that often was successful? <laughs> Not very much, but I still stuck with it. It was kind of like, well, no, but this is kind of what's worked for me to some point, and I have to keep committed to this because this is the right way. Didn't want to look incompetent, didn't want to look like, oh my gosh, I'm running late, or things were disruptors along the way. Um, and then I had children. 
Um, and you know, so I, again, I, I do a lot of consulting in maternal mental health. So you know all those pictures of women in white t-shirts? I have never had a white t-shirt after pregnancy. <laughs> Um, even now, and my children are nine and seven, and it's like, how can you just, uh, yeah, you had breakfast and you gave me a hug before I left for work, I have to change now. So it's one of those things where there are these constant reminders that no matter how much you plan and how um, much of a security blanket that feels to have those plans, you come as prepared as you can, but knowing that there's going to be deviations along the way, and it's okay, and sometimes... You know, um, it's funny, I remember that several years ago, I traveled to India with a, a group of my girlfriends, and we had agenda. We were like, we're waking up at this time, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do that, and we're going to do this. And so, interesting thing about traveling is that you get used to cultures, right? We had plans to start our day at 8 o'clock. Well, shops don't open till like 10, 10.30. The sign said 11. Somebody showed up at 1. So it was like... <laughs> you just derailed our entire day and experience. But what I learned from that is that we, by that organic process of, well, okay, so that's not open, let's go over here. We got to explore so many different things that were not even on our agenda. And I think that's a metaphor for just, you don't have to travel for that. It happens right in front of our faces in our day-to-day -day lives of, well, I expected this, it didn't work out, I had plans for this program to move this way, but you know what? I had a course correct and something more exciting popped up. Yeah. I think we can use the framework yeah. that Deanna was just showing when you're going through change, you know, have grit, but give yourself grace. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So what about you? How have you learned to... Um, I, I think um, I have always been adaptive to change. I somehow have entered a career that's full of change. I work in the pharmaceutical pricing industry, so it changes <laughs> with every administration. So... <laughs> Uh, but I can remember back when I was a junior in high school, and I just knew for a fact that once I graduated high school, I was going to the military. Knew it. Could not tell me anything differently. And I knew this at 16, 17 years old. I had this teacher, and I didn't know it at the time. She took on a mentor role for me. I didn't know it at the time, but now as I think back on it, I realize it. She knew, she knew of my plans once I graduated. She said, Denise, and her name is Mrs. Rosicki. Still remember her name. She said, Denise, you know, um, you know I, I realize the military is honorable. You know, uh, it's a good, a great career profession, but I really think you should go to college. It's like, uh, well, I will do that eventually. She's like, no, I think you, you have a lot to offer. You should go right out of high school. And... I think with that, um, so, I, so what happened is after I graduated high school, I did go to college. Uh, but, and, and because I had that conversation with her, and because I was receptive to hearing, and because I, I to your point, you can course correct, you can move in different uh, areas, but I also still wanted to serve my country, so I joined the National Guard. So that kind of gave me the best of both worlds. So I was a soldier, one week in a month, two weeks in the summer, and still attained my, my degree. But imagine had I not been open to that and, and, and had, had held steadfast on my decision, where would I be? Who knows? Mm -hmm. So... So we saw in the research that millennials seem to be facing even a little more stress. So Liz, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Did that resonate with you? And, and also maybe for those in the audience who are managing millennials, is there anything that they might do to help um, folks navigate through those stresses? Yeah, it, it absolutely resonates. Um, I think my friends and I all have this mindset that we'll work really, really hard um, up front early in our careers and it'll set us up for long-term success. And, you know, eventually when you reach that success or reach that level, then you can kind of take your, take your foot off the gas pedal. Um, but I don't think any of my friends or myself could really tell you what that level is or what that success looks like and when the acceleration will stop and that stress will subside. And so... I think that um, for millennials, the social media component doesn't help either. So if I log on to any of the social, any social media sites and I see a friend at a peer company who looks like she is just 
really accelerating and I'm like, geez, maybe I'm not doing as well. And so um, there's that the quote, uh, comparison is the thief of joy. And I definitely think that's Absolutely. contributing to some millennial stress as well. So, I mean, for me, I think that I want to continue to grow and live in these changing dynamic environments. And so if that means taking on more work, you know, while I'm still early in my career, um, then I don't see, I don't see that stress going away for myself or any of my friends right now. Mm -hmm. I just want to add, I don't know if that's just a millennial thing. (laughs) As you're talking, I'm thinking about that too, in terms of when does that working hard and proving yourself stop? Yeah, and I know you've done a lot of work with women um, in this area. What, or, or do you think there's some challenges that are particularly unique to women in managing the stress of changing work? I mean, it's well documented that it's it's money and family responsibilities that are the two biggest contributors, right? Like, I think about, for me personally, I'm in that sandwich generation, right? I've got young children. I've got an aging parent. Um, where do I put my times? And then I'm ambitious. I have a career. I want to invest. I want to give the best to my company because company is giving me my best mm-hmm. right now too. So um, what what supports do I put in place to help navigate that? Or even just recognizing and saying, I'm overwhelmed right now. You know, a lot of people will tell me, because I do do a lot. And I'm one of those people that... Um, you know, have a lot of balls in the air. And when I don't have a lot of balls in the air, it's kind of like, yeah, I can put it off till tomorrow. I can put it off till tomorrow. And then I become a procrastinator. (laughs) So it's, it's one of those where it's like, well, how do you do it all? Well, where is my energy and my passion really come from? You know, I love being a mom to my children. I brought my daughter into work um, when something happened with summer camp. And I came back from a meeting, and she's sitting at my cube, and she wrote on there, Bindu equals Juniper. And I immediately erased it, because I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I don't want anybody to walk by and, like, would I write that? Um, But I was talking to her about it on the way home, and I'm like, why did you write that? And she's like, mommy, I saw you working. You know, and it was one of those things. And my son was there, too, but he was all about the treats and <laughs> and all of that. And maybe it'll come later that he appreciates what it really means. But there was something that a nine-year-old girl was observing about me being in that work environment that just inspires me to find a way to integrate it. Mm. And it's, it is so important to find those sources of inspiration and energy when you're going through a lot of change at work and to really focus on keeping yourself healthy. So what are some other things that you guys do just to keep yourself healthy and centered? Well, I, I make time for myself and do not feel guilty about it. Uh, when I work, I'm working hard and I, I need to take the time for myself. Um, so I exercise regularly. Um, I spend time with family and friends. I, I travel. I visit wine country once a month. No kidding. <laughs> um, I, but I, I, I'm making time for myself, and I am not feeling guilty about it because I do not want to burn out. Mm-hmm. So we have to make time for ourselves. Um, I read an article this morning. A tech, exec, um, a tech manager um, um, an IT manager at a tech company, she, um, she sent an email to her team mm-hmm. notifying her that she would be out for a few days. Uh, she said she needed to take some mental health days. Mm-hmm. Um, she said, I'll come back, refresh, rejuvenated, re-inspired. A couple of days later, she got an email from the CEO who said, thank you. Thank you for sending out that email. Thank you for reminding us that our mental health is also our health. And you have those sick days there for a reason, or you have those PTO days for a reason. Use them. I I love use it or lose it. Use it or lose it is the best policy ever. Well, for me anyways. But it forces me to, to actually take that time and to, to use those days. I love that she is a leader modeled that for her mm-hmm. team. Um, I think that's so powerful. Um, let's talk about, you do some really 
I think, impactful things to keep yourself healthy. Talk a little bit about that. I do. So I think we all probably live and breathe by our calendars. And I am a big proponent of blocking your calendar. <laughs> so every day from 4.30 to 5.30, I have a block on my calendar and I go to the gym. Um, I probably don't work out for a full hour. That sounded very ambitious. But, uh, but it's blocked on my calendar. And I won't schedule meetings over that time. I try not to work. I try not to push it off. And by really protecting the time, I feel like I'm I'm giving a chance to take care of myself and really invest in myself and um, I'll do the same on the weekends if I have a Saturday I'm going to spend with friends then I block my work calendar not that anyone's scheduling a meeting on a Saturday but I still I block the time and I won't respond to emails for the day and that again makes me feel refreshed and it also helps me be really present with the ones I love when I'm with them and um, you know being able to, to selfishly block that calendar and, and take that time is really important. Mm. Have any of you really found yourself relying on outside resources when you've gone through a period of change? Like you said, you know, making sure that you have those people you love around you. Any, any stories of whether it's friends, family, coaches? Um, so I like, I, I think it's absolutely imperative to have a strong support system. So uh, within my support system are my sister friends, my uh, family, uh, coaches, and, and mentors, because there's going to be storms. You know, you're going to face adversity. So I want that support system to lean on in my time of need. And I refer to them as my um, hurricane readiness kit. <laughs> so whatever storm that the universe is, is throwing at me at mm -hmm. the time, I have a pretty solid kit. Everything is in there that I need. Mm -hmm. So just, but I, I also have to recognize that I have to know when to ask for the help. Sometimes we don't. So, uh, but they're, they're there and and more often than not, people are willing to, to help you out. You just have to ask. And I think, um, you know, I love Sheryl Sandberg's quote about um, one of the most important career decisions a woman will make at some point in their life is the partner you choose, right? Um, not only that, but I also definitely believe that you can't get everything from that one person. You know, you've got people that you will divulge that personal story with. You've got people that you'll talk about professional work challenges with. You know, you'll talk about people where you're trying to preserve that sense of who you are. Um, you know, your false sense versus your true sense. And then you'll have, you know, individuals and family members that you can really be free with. So I think it's important to reduce some of the expectations that we need that one person. I have so many mentors, so many mentors that know so many different aspects of who I am. And it was hard in the beginning because I felt like, okay, I need to tell you everything from A to Z about me. And it didn't work that way because it didn't, it, the relationship didn't pull that from me to share that, uh, that aspect or it didn't require me to really talk about that. And I got to a point where it was like, okay, it's okay that you see this part of me and I can reveal this part of me and, and not reveal that part and still feel authentic and okay and still get great feedback and support in that way. So definitely partner and multiple resource mm -hmm. support system. Mine's been very similar. I've thought of it as a board of advisors that yeah, I've developed yeah. over the years that I lean into for various pieces of support that I need. Yeah, and I would just add, I think I found I need two different types of support. I need the person I can call. So my mom is one example. I call my mom and vent and complain to her, and she unconditionally, kindly listens to me and will agree with everything I say. <laughs> um, and sometimes you really need that. Um, when I want the truth and the tough love, <laughs> I call my sister, who is um, also in the technology industry, several years older, and has a really amazing, successful career. And... Knowing that all of her advice comes from a good place, I hear some real tough feedback from her um, about my career, about my life. She obviously knows me very well. And so I, I need those two different kinds of coaches, the cheerleader and the, the, per, the bit of a drill sergeant to tell me the truth. Nice, nice. I think the other thing that I would add to that is that time for self-reflection, right? Mm -hmm. There's so much to gain from the external world. And 
we can kind of digitally de detox and take that moment for ourselves, sometimes we are our own best advisors on certain things. And how do we tune up and dial up that intuition to say, we've got this? Yeah. It's back to your point about taking that vacation yeah. time. Yeah. If you're not taking your vacation time, you're not doing yourself or your team or your colleagues any favors, yeah. trust me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let, let's shift a little bit from how you navigate your own experience with change to how you help others in the organization. So Bindu, talk a little bit about um, your experience as a manager. When you have people on your team who may not be comfortable with change, how yeah. you help them with that? That's definitely been a learning curve. So I oversee our new college grad program in marketing, and it's interesting working with um, millennials. I'm a millennial trapped in this body, by the way, so I can relate. <laughs> um, and it's, it's interesting because knowing that I'm an eight on a scale of one to five in terms of change and, you know, life experiences that have contributed to that, it's really given me a moment to pause and say, well, wait a second, I'm this comfortable with change, but not everybody around me, and especially as I'm helping um, this next generation of talent. So a lot of it is just making my expectations very clear. Look at I need you to communicate with me because I am kind of over on this end of the continuum in terms of change and, and embracing it and being okay with ambiguity. That if any of that feels uncomfortable, come to me. Create that space to be have that open dialogue, questioning. Um, where is your level? Just asking the same question you asked us, Cami. It's like on a scale of one to five, where are you with change? What aspects of change bother you? And really taking the time to look at that. There's great frameworks out there for everything, right? It depends on what one you want to pick. But Prochaska and Di Clemente talk a lot about the stages of change. And so there are things like pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, and then a maintenance stage. And you know, there's relapse. And I think when you look at those models, they're there for a reason. They help to kind of set a template or a guide to just help structure in terms of how you think about things. So I will bring things like that up and bring in some of those models to say, here's a change model. Like, how willing are you to, to adapt? If not, where can I help you? Because we are in ambiguous environments. We all know that, right? Silicon Valley, one day it's up, one day it's down. Um, so it's a skill that's really important. So I think definitely coming from an academic background, having that academic kind mm -hmm. of framework in mind really helps set the tone. Yep. And Liz, I mean, this is what you do every day, right? Yeah. And helping to assess folks for their ability to change and then helping to develop that in people. So talk a little bit about about how you do that here. Yep. So at Intuit, we have um, very specific innovation practices that we've developed over a many years, since 1983, and um, it's an expectation that all of our employees not only know and live and breathe the way we innovate, but um, are always customer-backed, and while we change, we need to learn to do this quicker than ever before, and so um, an example is now, as we hire, we're teaching all of our employees our uh, customer-driven innovation, so uh, one example is we, it's rapid prototyping. Um, in the past, we would go out and build a new feature for a product and spend all the money and put it in front of a customer and realize that that might not have been the right thing. And so what rapid prototyping does is really forces us as employees to be very uncomfortable. And within an hour, you brainstorm, ideate, commit to an idea prototype it on paper and put it in front of a real customer. So you do have some skin in the game because they're going to give you their tough feedback. But in doing so, we get the feedback we need to make our features and products better earlier before we go and invest all the money. But again, it's, it's an uncomfortable thing to this process that used to take us weeks. We're trying to do replicate in an hour. And as we hire new employees, we're having them learn that process up front and go through it. And by, you know, by the time they're into their teams and they've adapted and and, and learn and run with it. So it's being able to innovate in that faster period yeah. of change. And what are some of the kinds of questions and concerns that folks have when they're going through that process? Oh, yeah. It's, it's, I think um, so many great ideas can come up out of a brainstorm when you put a group together and a team and they, they have that opportunity just to think freely. And I think it's narrowing and committing to one idea that they're going to show the customer. Um, that's really, it's a teamwork exercise. And how do, you, how do you know what the customer wants and, and what's going to be best for them? And, and you don't know the answer is you don't know until you put it in front of them. So I think that the, the real challenge is, is committing to one of great ideas within a short period of time. Mm -hmm. 
So I think sometimes we are focused on trying to get employees who work for us comfortable with change, and sometimes we are trying to be a change agent in a company and really trying to figure out how to get coworkers and colleagues who may be a, not a five on a scale of one to five comfortable. So Denise, I'd love to hear thoughts on when you've tried to kind of lead change and had some colleagues who might be a little hesitant. What do you do? Um, so it, it's interesting. That's an interesting question because um, uh, the environment that I'm currently in, um, they can be somewhat resistant to change or what it's called is the, the Gilead way. Mm-hmm. It's not a good or bad thing, you know, but um, it, as you hire people uh, fr- from outside of the organization, you're bringing them in for fresh ideas. And so what I've learned uh, in the past couple of years is to um, get those colleagues comfortable with me, develop their trust. Mm -hmm. And you develop their trust by um, understanding differences in opinions, understanding differences in perspective, cultural differences, as well as just differences in thought. You know, because a lot of times people just want to be heard. Mm -hmm. And so if you can involve them early on in that change Mm -hmm. and also listen to hear and not listen to speak, which I must admit that's very difficult. But actually, and when you do that and when you learn to master that listen to hear and not to speak, great ideas come out that, Mm -hmm. that make the change a little easier for them to transition into. Yeah, I think there's a piece about um, perception and how we view change, right? Just when you say that word change, what words come to mind? There's this great book called um, titled Switch. I don't know if anybody's ever uh, has read that, right? But I'm getting a lot of head nods. But um, it's interesting. It changed my perspective in thinking about change. So the thesis in there is that maybe Resistance to change isn't so much resistance, but it's more exhaustion, right? So, and what the metaphor that they provide in the book is that if you think about kind of your emotional thinking, your emotional reaction to situation is the elephant, and kind of more of your cognitive processes, your thinking about things is more of the rider of the elephant. So you're spending your entire day because we're all stressed out. Um, in separate directions, with the rider going in one way, the elephant going the other way, imagine the energy of that rider having to pull and align with that elephant. So here I'm going to ask you for one more change to that program, one more change to that project. Now all of a sudden it's like, what? You've asked me to change the world. No, it was one slight thing, but because you've been in this constant state of stress, any small amount of change feels much more like resistance versus Mm -hmm. somebody's really exhausted. Great. I'll open it up to questions from the audience. What would you like to hear about from this very esteemed panel? Yeah. I think there's some microphones that we can move around. I just throw it. <laughs> I thank you for the great panel. Uh, as for myself, the biggest change I did was go back to school after 20 years. Do a, uh, <laughs> thank you. Just finished my MBA from Wharton. Nice. And part of that, uh, last month I went to Rwanda and mm. uh, to learn conflict leadership and change. And it's an amazing country because it ranks fifth in gender equality, and I was amazed to find that, while U.S. is 45th. <laughs> So it, personally, I was really learning about the strategies uh, that they adopted. And one of the key things was including men in conversations, mm-hmm. which is very Absolutely. important because we try to solve gender inequality by just having women in conversations. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to know in your personal lives and in your companies, have you adopted those strategies and in what ways have you been successful? Great question. A really good question. So absolutely, for for myself, um, I have an informal mentor now that um, is a male, and he offers some very sound advice. Um, of course, he, he usually says to me, "Don't take it personal." <laughs> it seems so simple. Sorry. Um, however, um, it's really true. Don't take it personal. Just don't don't take it personal and. 
I, I, I love when I, I'll get worked up and he'll say, you know what, don't take it personal. And then I take a step back and I'm like, you know what, this is how I should approach uh, the, the situation. So I think that as women, we have, you know, our women organizations such as Watermark, but they, then there's our allies. So um, there's women groups and employee resource groups for women, but we need those male allies. So uh, if you don't have one, like seek out a, a, an informal male mentor. Um, they offer some really great advice. I think the thing that I would add on to that personally is definitely having those conversations and calling out things. Because as we, again, heard earlier today, if someone's in this perspective or in this swim lane, it's, it's rare that they're going to look up and say, oh, I wonder how they're doing over there, right? And especially if you haven't had that personal experience. So, um, you know, a lot of the work that's really influenced um, the happy leader, if you will, is, was, stemmed, uh, was created by Daryl Wing Sue. And he's got this model where you look at in-groups and out-groups, majority way of thinking and minority way of thinking. So when I think about those contexts and how can I start to have those conversations and say, wait, hold on, if you were to step in my shoes, right, the level of empathy here, literally put these heels on and, and walk in them and see what it's like and experience that. You know, Corn Ferry has this great research out there that talks about the success that executives experience when they get to those C-level um, positions. And two of the p key indicators are self-awareness and two, the experiences you've had. Have you had experiences stepping in? So um, when I was teaching in a graduate psych program, there was a social psych and difference class that I taught. And one of the exercises was for 24 hours, go and do something completely different than what you're comfortable in. Mm -hmm. And there was one young woman who, the story is just very powerful. I wish I could articulate it as well as she would when she came back. But she was a Anglo Christian American woman, and she wore a burqa, a full on burqa in Chicago for 24 hours. She went to the same grocery store, she went to the same gym, she did all of the same things that she had done. And it wasn't until she came and reported back to the class what those 24 hours were like for her and the kind of experience that she had. And it was interesting, and the, uh, the other telling point to that was that students within the class ranged, like some, you know, went to a different uh, church, or they went to a different community, or, you know, they drove 60 miles to, you know, go to a community that they, that they never experienced. So what people's comfort zones are in terms of being able to travel and do something like that, right? I mean, we can read all this data and look at all these frameworks, but until we experience it shifts the conversation tremendously and your genetic coding. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions or stories, observations about change? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, not so much a question, but an add-on. Uh, I'm Michael Ann Conley, and I'm a happy member of Watermark. Yay. Um, when, when you talked about exhaustion, uh, Bindu, it reminded me of a wonderful essay that can be found online by a poet. His name is David White, with a Y. Mm -hmm. And it's called 10 Questions That Should Never Go Away. Mm -hmm. And in one of those questions, the number escapes me in the moment, he talks about a conversation he had with a mentor of his about exhaustion. Mm -hmm. And the mentor said, the antidote to exhaustion is not rest. It's wholeheartedness. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh! I get so I just wanted to share <laughs> that. For sure, yeah. When you said that, I went, ah! I just want to tell the whole group yeah. Yeah. because yeah. so often as women, we push, 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 push over the edge, mm -hmm. and then we think we're just gonna rest, you know, just lie back and just collapse <laughs> and all of that, and that's sort of the opposite. But to gather our wholeheartedness mm -hmm. is. Uh, as I, I really resonate with that, Thank you. and I can tell you to do. <laughs> yes, yeah, obviously. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, question here. I really love these conversations. They're, it's just amazing to look at all these people. But I think there's probably a very, quite a few number of people here who struggle with that question of, should I stay or should I leave? Yeah, 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 like yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe mm -hmm. you're just not sure it's ever going to work out. How do you make that decision? Mm -hmm. 
I feel like we need a theme song yeah, for that. Yeah. 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 For me, um, a telltale sign is when I wake up in the morning, the majority of the, t of the time, dreading going to work, mm -hmm. it, I think it's time for me to get out of there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I understand and I recognize that there will be challenges uh, throughout organizations. But, um, and, and I usually give it a little time. I usually try to ride that wave. Uh, but if it's majority of the time, I'm just dreading being somewhere. Mm -hmm. I'm not really learning anything. I've shut myself down completely. Mm -hmm. And I would rather leave and have those um, strong relationships in place than to leave on a bad note mm -hmm. and not maintain those relationships afterwards. Yeah. You know, something that um, I do, not just from a work-related perspective, but just even relationships, right? Should I prune this relationship in my life or should I keep it is, you know, divide a sheet of paper in half and kind of free associate thoughts that come to mind. And then the second, the, the other half to that is reframing a nice way of saying what I want to say, right? So if, okay, my my I'm having a difficult relationship with my boss, what do I really want to say? You know, and being very candid and honest and giving myself permission to just literally vomit the kind of <laughs> hardcore, just really um, very vulnerable, honest responses to this relationship. And then if I can't find a way to reposition that or say that, okay, this individual is having a bad day or this, you know, this is just a change in the environment and maybe if I write it out. And if I see that one list is much longer than the other, that definitely starts to help kind of course yeah. correct. I was really intrigued by this topic. Um, so I actually wrote a book about it and did a lot of research, interviewed a lot of, a lot of people, did some quantitative research. And one of the things I came to see is it's important to really step back and think about where the sources of pain are coming from. Mm -hmm. It might be relationships that are broken at work. It might be that you don't have the opportunity to grow in your job anymore. It might be that it doesn't fit your lifestyle needs. So really thinking about those sources of pain and then um, through some reflection, through you know, working with trusted partners, assess whether you can make some changes to those things that are giving you pain. But if you can't, then life is much too short and work is much too, part of, much too much a part of how we spend our time and our identity to have it steal your soul. So find a place that, that uses your best. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. You were, you were okay. next. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to uh, ask a question or follow up on what Liz said about continuous innovation. Um, Organizations that embrace change and that uh, go for continuous innovation have to also allow for, as I always say to my team, A is not, a perfect is not the only passing grade. Mm -hmm. Failure is okay. If you're going to say to people, err on the side of execution, try new things, some of those things won't work. And there can't be, the penalty for that cannot be extreme because you want to get out there and try a lot of things. And I think as women, and this is a, a, a terrible generalization, but as women, sometimes we internalize those failures. We want things oh, yes. to be perfect. Instead mm -hmm. of saying, we tried this and it didn't work, and compartmentalizing and moving on and saying, what did we learn from that? Um, we feel, I failed, not that it failed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that in, in building organizations that embrace change, we also have to build organizations that say, okay, negative results are also results. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Let's see, let's take one more question here. There's someone in the back? Yes. Okay, we'll take two more. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a comment and then a question. So uh, about eight years ago, I had an illness that caused all of my hair to fall out. And I had been dyeing my hair. Mm. Uh, and when it came back in, it came back in white. Um, when I went back to work, I cannot tell you the difference in how I was treated mm -hmm. because I had white hair. Mm -hmm. um, and I had initially not gone back to re-dye it because they weren't sure if that would not be a good idea. But I realized that I would sit at the same company in the same meeting mm -hmm. with the same people. I've worked at my company for 25 years. The same people I've known for 25 years 
So I know when I go into a meeting with them, you're going to complain about this. You're going to ask this question, <laughs> right? I know these people really well. <laughs> and so I went into a meeting ready to respond and proposed what I wanted to propose. And they all said, OK. And I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know what to do with that. I thought well, maybe they felt sorry for me because I'd been sick. It continues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It continues. So I was completely unprepared mm -hmm. for the change in the way people respond to me with white hair. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so I wasn't ever wrong before. It's just now <laughs> everything is so easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. Just, I, I mean, it's wonderful. So anyone that's dyeing their hair, I, you know, <laughs> if you're on the edge about that, I would just say it's amazing. <laughs> Everybody takes my word for everything now. <laughs> Great tip. Unanticipated change. But um, I wanted to ask a question. So I moved here a year ago from Chicago. Um, it appears to me that Silicon Valley is embracing women much more than they did in the Midwest. And um, I just, I'd love your assessment on is this part of the country doing a better job? Uh, since you also moved from Chicago and from the Midwest? You know, I, it's really hard to answer that question because I, I go back to context, right? When I was in the Midwest, I was in academia. <laughs> Need I say more? Um, you know, and in healthcare, whereas I don't have that context here in, in the same comparison, you know, it'd be very different. But what I do have to say is I, have, I haven't felt... 18 years in Chicago, and, and I haven't felt that level of connection and sisterhood that I experience here. Mm -hmm. When I first moved to the Valley and I said, okay, I'm going to call this senior executive woman at this company because she showed up on my LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, friends were like, you can't just call her. I was like, why not? You know, back to your, <laughs> why not? Why can't I? Um, and I would call and she would say, okay, my assistant's going to get you in. I'm like, oh my gosh, okay, now what do I do? Now what do I do? <laughs> it happened. I wasn't prepared for that. I was all gung-ho for step one, but then what <laughs> happened after that? The receptivity to connect with women and empower each other, I personally feel that to be very unique and different to the Valley. And again, we're all reading the news. We're seeing the kinds of things that are coming up from all these various companies. And I think, you know, there's... There's a lot of unconscious bias. There's a lot of stuff that's hidden and protected. And as women, how do we support each other, right? When, when tides rise, we all have to, like, you know, help each other up through that. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I can definitely very confidently say I really do experience. And I've only been here six years. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do one more question. Get the mic. So I, I tend to have a reframing personality sometimes and drives people crazy, but it, it sometimes works. And I was listening to you talk about the tension that comes when things aren't going right and how powerless we can feel and why isn't this working the way that it should. And it occurred to me that um, a, several years ago, I began to learn something that changed my outlook altogether. When things are going great, I'm happy. The moment things start to derange mm -hmm. and start to feel uncomfortable, mm -hmm. I used to get frightened and wonder, OK, what am I going to do? How can I fix this? And then one day I said, OK, if it's uncomfortable now when it used to be comfortable, it's time for me to let go. Mm -hmm. That's all there is to it. I'm mm -hmm. not going to investigate what's going on. It doesn't matter. I'm being prepped for something else. And then once I started to see that, it became clear. When time came for me to move to my next level, everything I was comfortable with became uncomfortable immediately. Mm -hmm. Nothing I was doing. Mm -hmm. And it was just the universe setting it up for that next opportunity. And once I began to see that, man, life was easier. Yeah. Because then it was just, oh, OK, time to go. And, and, and there was no strain about trying to stay where I was mm -hmm. because I wasn't going to be able to. Yeah. Yeah. It didn't matter. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Great. So that was the reframe that I, I came across that I wanted to share. Thank it was you. Really yeah. exciting. Thank you. Thank you. 
So we can continue this conversation over lunch because as you can tell, there's tremendous wisdom in this room, not just in this panel, but throughout yeah, yeah. this room. I've got a couple of quotes I just wanted to leave you with as we go off into lunch. Um, yeah, the first is that the secret of change is to focus all of your energy, not on fighting on the old, but on building the new. Another one, some changes look negative on the surface, but you'll soon realize that space is being created in your life for something new to emerge. And finally, it takes a lot of courage to release the familiar and seemingly secure to embrace the new, that there's no real security in what is no longer meaningful. Yes. So thank you guys. And again, look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you, Pam. Great, thank you so much for the panelists, for sharing your perspectives, um, as well as the moderator. Thank you for just um, highlighting and sharing your stories with uh, personal and organizational changes. I'm Janice Parthen. I'm a consulting director at RSM with the Fifth uh, National Firm um, here in the US oh, with international great. presence. Um, but what I uh, also want to mention, um, as being part of the Emerging Executive Advisory uh, Committee member, just it's been great experience having to attend a variety of these events um, here hosted by the Watermark, as well as uh, others, members, and so hope you enjoyed uh, the morning so far. Uh, what I want to tell you is our lunch information. <laughs> um, so lunch is being served, lunch is right outside, uh, but there's also a room dedicated for you if you like to go ahead and sit down and have lunch there. Um, but then also on the other side of uh, this uh, corner area, you could also go and sit and have lunch there as well if you like, as well as the patio, outside patio. So you have opportunity to do that. Um, the other information I wanted to share is that we'll be reconvening at 1240. Um, so, and then there's gonna be an exciting raffle uh, drawing for an Apple Watch, um, as well as a Watermark membership. So please come back to uh, participate in that with the little red uh, stub that you had received when you first signed in. Um, and so enjoy the lunch break and take an opportunity to go buy books or get your portrait taken by Shutter Divas, who's gonna be around the corner in the main area. So please stop by and see her as well. Thank you.